Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have an incredibly important panel in an incredibly important moment in history. Uh, my name is Alex Merle. I'm the panel moderator. I'm a Ukrainian American wearing a Slavo Ukraini shirt, which means glory to Ukraine. You might have heard that uh, in the news or media or on Twitter. Um, this is not only an important time for Ukraine, but it's an important time for the world and in particular for the West and the Western world order. Uh, and it falls on all of us um, thrust into this moment to do something about ensuring uh, its protection, ensuring Ukraine's protection. Um, and the panel that we have assembled today, um, Bob Gorley, Junaid Islam, and Evgeny Efnievsky, have a unique perspective, each have a unique perspective on what's happening, uh, but also a hand to play in the solutions that are going to be necessary in order for us to uh, respond to this crisis, this war, the way that we need to. Uh, very briefly, uh, the full bios are on the website. Um, and uh, you can link to them. Uh, so Bob Gorley is former CTO of the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, he's also currently CTO and founder of UDA, uh, cyber threat analysis um, firm, and also author of the cyber threat. Junaid Islam uh, is a cybersecurity and secure communications professional in the public and private sector for 30 years. Uh, and Evgeny is uh, an Oscar and Emmy nominated director. Uh, whose two films uh, that are most relevant to this topic are Winter on Fire, which documented the Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine um, in 2014-15, uh, was Oscar nominated, and also Cries from Syria, um, which did a similar um, perspective or similar work on the war in Syria uh, in both cases where Russia was uh, an aggressor and instigator. So, with that, I'm going to let each of the panelists do a short introduction and statement, just with some, uh, you know, a sort of short introductory statement with some thoughts, and then we're going to jump into a very important discussion that's sort of at the intersection of information warfare, cybersecurity, secure communications, and of course, of course, also global Western security. Thank you. Um, why don't we start with Bob? Hello, thanks, Alex, and for everyone, I think uh, you all recognize as informed uh, people digesting as much of this as you can that this is a extremely serious issue, of course, for the free nation of Ukraine, but for all free nations, because this is taking part against the backdrop of a big struggle of open societies against totalitarian societies, and it seems like even a year ago, uh, you couldn't say things like that. If you did, you were called a radical and your voices were suppressed. Uh, it's supposed to be one big common brotherhood of man. Uh, well, I tell you, we need to wake up. And I think this is making us all stronger and making most of the world recognize that this is a struggle between open societies and closed societies. Now, maybe there's more education that needs to occur on that. Um, not every nation denounced Russia as strongly as they should have. Some are adamantly and aggressively neutral uh, in very surprising ways. Um, but I think it has woken up a large number of people about how serious this has to be taken. And of course, we want to do everything to ensure the survival of Ukraine because uh, there's a lot of stakes on the table. And I don't want to keep going too much because uh, we want to get into some questions and answers. But Wanted to let you know where I stand. Thank you, Bob. Sinead? Thank you all for uh, showing up this morning or, or uh, lunchtime in, on the East Coast. Uh, you know, I just want to add to Bob's point why this is important from my perspective, and that is the obvious coordination between China and Russia on this. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, Russia delayed this uh, at China's request around the Olympics. Uh, China is providing them a lot of intelligence information. Uh, China is uh, providing them a countermeasure to any sanctions by the United States. Uh, this, this is all open, you know, where, <clears throat> you know, they're buying Russian oil in exchange uh, for access to all of their products and services. I think we should not be fooled and naive to think that this is not a coordinated action and that whether or not you care about Ukraine, uh, if Ukraine falls, China will take Taiwan, and the United States at this moment is not ready to protect Taiwan. We are just, you know, and we have to be honest with ourselves. To fortify Taiwan, we'd have to put anti-aircraft missiles, we'd have to fortify the coastline, we'd have to arm the population, all things we're learning in Ukraine. We are, we are not ready. So I think that, to me, really emphasizes the importance for all Americans 
to do a great job in protecting Ukraine to uh, Bob Gorley's point. You know, it, irrespective of what political party you're affiliated with, what your beliefs are, uh, what your beliefs are on, you know, was NATO expansion uh, a reason to move in or not? We must not let Ukraine fall no matter what. Uh, and with that, I look forward to this session. We have a lot of great, <laughs> I, uh, some of the audience members are quite <laughs> important. So I hope to hear from the audience and would pass the virtual mic uh, to our, uh, well, one, our, our guest of honor who's, who's made some great films on this topic. Thank you, Evgeny. Um, thank you guys for having me. I want to take even more wider what was just said. I think it's a case study for every dictatorship in today's world. I think it's not only about China and Taiwan, and China will be observing right now how the world will react to the invasion of Ukraine and think, should they do their first step or should they wait? I think we need to go briefly into the history when Barack Obama announced red line in Syria about chemical weapon and no action happened when Assad started to continue using chemical weapon. I think that's where it goes. At the end of the day, today, there is so many more totalitarian regimes that are observing today what's happening with the world. The world is way, way divided. So for every totalitarian regime today, it's important to see, will the world stand for Ukraine? And I think we as the world, and we as the leading country of this world, need to show this example. We need to encourage all others be for Ukraine for many reasons. A, that nothing else will happen in the world. No other totalitarian regime will take you know, over another country. No chemical weapon, no heavy weapons that already been used in, in Ukraine and same heavy weapons, same prohibited weapons been used in Syria. I witnessed this when I was doing my movie there. So we, if we create an agreement prohibiting certain weapons, we need to obey by them, but it's used and nobody condemning these dictators. So there is so many lessons to learn from this. And I also want, as a filmmaker who witnessed how the winter on fire happens in Ukraine, how the revolution, Alex, 2013, 14 actually happened in Ukraine, we must also remember, yes, it's happened way far in Ukraine, but there is a writer that sits in Kremlin and this writer can write the scenario that can happen also in US. And I will give you a horrifying example. In 2013, students came to the peace protests on the Ukrainian square Maidan. They wanted to be a part of you. It was infiltration of people who started problems with the police and police beaten these uh, students, peaceful students. 2020, BLM movement in the United States. People protesting on the streets, infiltration and the police beating literally peaceful protests. Second step in Ukraine, the monuments were taken down, historical monuments, United States 2020, historical monuments 20, coming down immediately after BLM protests. Then immediately Viktor Yanukovych, Russian president calling Vladimir Putin who advising him to bring the forces into the city and crush protests. Back 2020, Donald Trump as the president calling Vladimir Putin all over the Southern National Guards entering the cities. Sounds kind of strange, but it seems that the same scenario plays already in our own land in the United States. So now let's think there is a great writer sitting in Kremlin who can rewrite the history in different places in the world. Ukraine that right now fighting for their freedom, fighting for their dignity. In America, who was thinking that we do have democracy and we are protected. But all of a sudden, if you will look at 2020, we are not. We are not. And same scenario that happened in Ukraine in 2013-14 can be easily played here in 2020. So let's think if the scenario that playing right now with Russia in Ukraine can happen here anytime. So that's why we need to protect Ukraine. That's why we need to really show to the world that we must stand for this country, that no other dictator can combine his strengths with Vladimir Putin. And literally, we need to stand united as the world united for Ukraine and for any other part of the world that can be taken by the dictators. 
Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny, for that um, you know excellent insight. Um, people always think it well, not me, and and uh, it is absolutely true that it can very quickly escalate. You can reach tipping points, and once you reach that tipping point, um, it, it happens very quickly. And I think the greatest lesson of that that we're living, unfortunately, right now is that a lot of people around the world did not think that this was going to escalate, that Putin was going to invade. Bob, uh, you were one of the few voices, frankly, that, that was open about uh, the opposite view, that Putin was likely to invade. Um, after eight years of war, and Russian war in Ukraine, why is it you think so many people missed that? Um, and what is it that you saw that they didn't? And what can we learn from it? Well, um, we need to be careful about the lessons that I'm about to say, because when war starts, it's you need different kind of methods for predicting what happens next. Uh, but prior to this, I think a lot of us as human beings fell into the old trap that the way it is today is going to be the way it is tomorrow. Everything's fine. You know, in uh, the, the, the book, uh, uh, The Black Swan, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talked about uh, a thousand days in the life of a turkey. Everything's going fine until the thousandth day and things change. Well, um, let me talk a little bit more about analysis and why we, for over a year, was saying this is a very serious risk of happening. Uh, we pulled together our team at UDA, including our analysts, but a network of people. We meet monthly, and we ask business leaders, what's on your mind, um, and what are you thinking the big threat is? And people like Junaid help drive our uh, risk list. And this came to the top about a year ago. We talked about many other risks, but we started to focus more and more on that. Now, I was a Navy intelligence officer for 20 years. And in that 20 years, uh, at the first part of my career, it was study the Soviet Navy. And to understand the Soviet Navy, you need to study Soviet culture, Soviet history, um, uh, going way back. And that came in very handy in doing this analysis also, because we would see uh, Putin invoking uh, history a lot um, and uh, using that to build an argument for why uh, Moscow should be worried about another invasion. Now, I hope I don't um, I get the history wrong. And Evgeny, uh, please uh, correct me if I get this totally wrong. But uh, the culture seems to be the one that Putin was playing to. Uh, we have been invaded since our founding in the year 860. Uh, when the Slavs were brought together. They're still mad about the Mongol invasions of 1200. And of course, uh, Napoleon plays uh, into this culture too. And the devastation he wrecked on uh, Russia and the Soviet Union, of course, the great patriotic war and the devastation of the Nazi invasion. Uh, so he takes that and plays to that culture and says, obviously the encroachment of NATO getting closer and closer is a threat that has to be dealt with. Now, I don't believe that's the reason that he wants to crush Ukraine, but he uses that as an excuse and a motivator. Uh, but other things I learned as an intelligence officer is when an enemy is telling you what they're going to do, you should pay attention. And he was making it very clear he wants to reestablish uh, control over the former Soviet republics. And, and then as uh, the year progressed, he was making it very clear uh, by moving troops right next to the border. And as we got closer and closer to uh, the invasion, um, we assessed that, look, he already made his mind up probably a year ago, and nothing we say in diplomacy will change his mind. He is definitely going to invade. And we started saying that in November. Unfortunately, in December, we stomped really hard on that. Uh, issuing advisories saying when he does invade, this is what it means for your cybersecurity posture. Um, I won't say it was widely ignored, but we needed to, we got that into the government and said, please start producing your assessments on this. Finally, in January, we see the Department of Homeland Security saying, hey, there is a risk of invasion. Let's get our cyber stuff together. Um, so um, that was kind of why we were pushing this so hard. But now I'm just one caution here. Uh, because we were able to, to talk about that threat and many other threats, um, once the war starts, it is so much harder to make accurate assessments on what's going to unfold because it is the ultimate competition. It's a horrible, horrible conflict, and no one can say with certainty what's going to happen. Um, although, Thank you. Um, yeah, that's the, yeah, just some initial thoughts. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, very instructive. And, you know, Bob and Junaid have particular expertise, obviously, in understanding the big picture in this adversary, but uh, also in cyber, which we'll get to. 
But so far, we haven't seen that deployed. But what we have seen deployed, and Bob, you, you touched on this in a slightly different way, is the authoring of narratives, that, that, that there's people in the Kremlin who write the story, and the story they want us to hear, and that how that shapes um, the battlefield, how that shapes the battlefield leading up to the war, and of course, is continuing to shape the battlefield today. So Yevgeny, what lessons do you think we can draw in particular about Russia's crafting of the information space um, both in the leading up to the war, as Bob touched on, but also critically now, um, and how can we respond to those effectively by shining the light of truth on them? Evgeny? He stuck on yeah. mute. Okay. Uh, the, first of all, the lesson, the great lesson that we need to remember and to know that Vladimir Putin started to change the history. When I was a kid in former Soviet Union, we learned one history. When I was my, on Maidan, I witnessed completely reality and realized that what I studied the history of the former Soviet Union and how things working are completely different. I do also witness interesting narrative how was created since Maidan happened. And I witnessed the whole war that cameras started to become, became a weapon. It was in Syria, it was in Russia. Russia technically adapted everything what happened in 1939 when Gable said, take a lie big enough, repeat it over and over, and it becomes truth. The same Gables in 1939 said, truth is an enemy of the state. And I guess these two major things became a key points in a warfare, new warfare, with the media and cameras that Russia, Kremlin, any totalitarian regime started to implement. And well, that's basically the narrative that was crafted and was going over and over and over. In today's world, there is a population of Russia that only watching Russian TV and they seeing this invasion. They see that basically what Putin doing is the protecting big empire. And what he's trying to do, he's trying to bring almost every Russian Republic back into the former Soviet Union because they all want that. That's the crafting of the narrative. And now I want to say another thing, why it's important to stop Putin there. Because if Putin not stopped on Ukraine and will take over Ukraine, then there is Baltic Republics which became already free republics, and they will be the next, Putin not will stop on Ukraine. Now, another aspect, why for Putin, Ukraine is very important. Ukraine showed to the world that they can stand for their fight for freedom. By the 2013-14, which I witnessed and documented, they proved to the world their determination to be a free spirit, European country is way, way strong, and they will not go back to the slavery. I mentioned this the other day at CNN. I was asked by CNN correspondent, why, 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 why Ukrainians fighting? Why? Because they rather die under the bullets, but not as the slaves. The great example was two days ago when the kids went to protest against the war in former Soviet Union, and they were arrested. Kids being put behind the bars. Yesterday was the new law announced stating anyone who's saying no war will be prosecuted. So more in, in Russia, more, to, to clarify, just, just so it's clear in Russia. So Russia more and more fighting the ability of the foreign media trying to interfere with his narrative. He is fearing that Russian people will awake against him and his narrative. He is crafting it. He is fighting this. That's why Ukrainians are fighting. Because for them to go back into slavery, they rather die free people than as a slaves. And I think that's a remarkable thing to admit. So that's, Alex, the lessons that we can see and we can learn. But the biggest thing for Putin is he needs to take Ukraine because he needs to show example to other republics that if anybody will be revolting, I will quash you. And if we will help to Ukraine to sustain free country, an independent country, which they became actually in 1991, not only in 2013-14, when they went into the European Union direction. 
as the independent country, they became in 1991, way earlier. So for no. Putin, this example can't be exist. He don't want, he who trying to rewrite the history, exactly like Bob said, he can't just even think about this matter, that the Ukraine is free and Ukraine will be a member of NATO and Ukraine will be, because that will be example to any other republic. Then tomorrow, Georgia and many others will jump into this basically train. So for him, under any circumstances, he can't allow this thing to happen. So that's a now, great example too. Now, Yevgeny, there's one, I, this, this wasn't on the questions we prepared, but I realize now as we're talking that it's important and that you can uh, specifically speak to. So as an Israeli citizen, um, you know, a lot of this narrative, you can, you can speak to us as an Israeli citizen, a lot of this narrative from Putin that we've, we're continuing to hear um, is that they're fighting Nazis, neo-Nazis, the neo-Nazi junta in Kiev, of course, there are only two countries in the world where uh, the president is um, is Jewish, and Ukraine and Israel are those two countries. So the idea of that, and President Zelensky, of course, has been uh, trying his best, not only in the embodiment of himself as a Jewish uh, president of Ukraine, but also publicly talking about it. But what is it about this narrative, and, and why is it uh, so powerful and so used by Russia, um, despite the very obvious evidence that it's incorrect? Well, it's very easy. Let's think a simple example, metaphorical example. What can rage the bull? Red cloth. What can rage Russian people? The Nazis. Second World War. Memory of the trauma. That's what Putin is using. Something that can aggravate people and make them to think about these horrors of Second World War. That's why it's easy to use metaphorical word of Nazi in order to enrage people and make them fear because that's the historical fact. It's like a red cloth for the bull. Yeah, understood, thank you. And I um, want to add something else. Yes, yeah, Zelensky is a Jewish blood person, but you had before prime minister of Ukraine who also was completely Jewish and so and so and so. So guys, there is so many historical facts about Ukraine and many Jewish people who were representing Ukraine. So I think we don't need to go way, way far that we're talking today about Zelensky in the previous administration, we were talking about their prime minister Grossman. So again, there is evidence that there is many different nationalities who are living in Ukraine. You can say the same thing about Armenia right now. First person who died, freely died for Ukraine was Sergei Gayan, and he was Armenian. Who was the second one, Zhiznevsky, Belarusian. So Ukraine in today's world, as the country sustained from many nationalities who live in peace. I have a clip of Sergei when we were interviewing him. He said, I will die for this country because that's my home. That's the future. And that's where I live. Thank you, Evgeny, for that. Um, I want to touch on cyber a bit because there are a lot of people ask, why, why should we care about Ukraine? We've already talked about a lot of potentially even more important reasons. But as we saw with NotPetya and other attacks, um, before the war escalated to uh, an all-out open conflict, that what happens in Ukraine doesn't stay in Ukraine because all of our networks and systems are interconnected. And of course, some of the vulnerabilities are the same and can be exploited. But so far in this conflict, um, and maybe I'm wrong, you would know better than me, but so far, you know, knocking on wood here, we haven't seen cyber utilized as much as perhaps some of us expected and predicted, some of the expert community expected and predicted. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that is? And then second, um, whether you think there's going to be a phase where we see cyber attacks? And then third, just to make it easy, what it is we can do to, to protect Ukraine and ourselves against that eventuality? Uh, Bob and Janaid in any order. Okay, then um, let me start by saying, uh, we do not have good instrumentation over Ukrainian systems right now. So we're just speculating on what Russia is or is not doing there uh, we did see some initial uh, cyber work. So let me give you a, a, a what I think is a reasonable assessment. I believe that the GRU and other um, Russian government organizations are right now using um, espionage as the primary tool in networks. So it's cyber espionage designed not to be detected, but to learn everything they can about government intentions, uh, to find where people are who are on their known kill list and to be able to quickly get them uh, when the time comes. So no need to bring the network down. It's not gonna help your war effort. Find out everything you can about adversary intentions. 
I believe they're there, but that is just speculation based upon uh, past uh, activities. Uh, I also think it's logical to say that there's going to be a lot of hungry people in Russia who will do anything for any kind of financial benefit. And that means cybercrime is back on the table, whether the government directs it or not. They're coming. Uh, that's just uh, the short version. But Janaid, thoughts? Yeah, I just want to build on uh, Bob's uh, comments. And the one simple way to think about uh, Russia has uh, he uh, bombers and uh, cruise missiles, and they haven't used that right now in Ukraine. It doesn't mean they are never going to use it. <laughs> it means they, they have a plan of gradually increasing tensions and, and escalating. And just like uh, bombers and rockets are a part of that plan, uh, so is cyber. Do not be fooled that uh, just because they haven't shut off our power system here in the United States uh, or, or shut down our communications that they don't have the capability uh, they, they have a very good topology uh, IP map. You know, it's been well known that they've been scanning the United States for years. They weren't scanning the United States and building an IP address map just for the hell of it. Uh, they built it so that if a conflict happened, that they would be able to disable us in the United States. This makes it even more important for us to uh, really increase our posture in uh, protecting ourselves, uh, making sure simple things from uh, multi-factor authentication turned on on all our systems. It's a free feature, as uh, as Bob writes and I write. Uh, a lot of things we can do for free, like turn uh, MFA on. Uh, other things we can do that only take an afternoon, which is backing up our systems. So if Russia decides to wipe out our data, we can recover. I mean, it, it literally takes only an afternoon to do that in all American companies should do that. And then we can do more sophisticated things like implement secure email and secure comms. But, uh, you know, as, as we've discussed, do not be fooled that because the Russians haven't launched a cyber attack against Western Europe or the United States, that it's not in their portfolio, number one. And also do not be fooled that China will <clears throat> not help them. China will help them launch a cyber attack on the United States because that positions them for their you know, larger strategy to uh, take over the Pacific. Back to you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, question, so what can we do to help? Uh, you know, obviously a few of you have mentioned um, secure communications and the ability of Russia to use whether human resources or try to track those communications. Um, obviously in managing for you from the Ukrainian perspective, managing this conflict, which is now spread across the majority of the country, um, includes regular forces and territorial defense forces. How important are secure communications and you know, is there anything we can do to help Ukraine? Yeah, well, uh, let, let me just make a point and then Bob. <clears throat> so I, I think one of the things uh, we can do that's non-lethal uh, because you know people are nervous in the United States of put, putting military personnel on the ground. We can certainly extend our technology bubble as it were. Uh, in the United States, we do have a lot of secure communications uh, capabilities, commercial, this isn't classified, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, so Bob and I are already <clears throat> helping some teams uh, in Ukraine uh, as, <laughs> as this is being recorded. Uh, I think we can do more uh, in terms of opening up the technology portfolio in the United States to um, help them. Uh, we've also seen publicly uh, Starlink uh, donating uh, uh, Starlink nodes, which is a great first step. I think what we should do is consider securing those nodes uh, and basically uh, lighting up the whole country and providing an alternate. So there's a, a number of things we can do. And I think uh, that's rolling out on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, many of us are on calls like all day, every day, but we can do more. And uh, you, you know, if, uh, there's so many people on this call uh, who, who have a lot of expertise and links to other companies. I would encourage everybody to think about becoming more active as Americans. Thank you for that, Janaid. And, and again, I wanna bring something up that brings Evgeny into the discussion because in the West, we tend to think of cyber and information warfare as, as separate things, right? Existing in bubbles there in their lanes. Maybe that's changing a bit. Again, Bob and Janaid would maybe know better, but um, you know, in Ukraine, you can see how they cross over. So one thing that I just really haven't fully understood, and Bob answered part of this, but Evgeny, I think maybe you can address it from a different perspective, is they haven't brought the communication networks down. And my hypothesis has been that maybe it was because they thought it would be an easy victory. They'd be welcome in some cities. And so you want the networks up. So people are tweeting things and showing videos that show Russia's strong 
uh, organized, welcomed, and victorious. But as the time has gone on, that has clearly not been the case. Um, you're actually getting quite a different picture from social media of uh, a force that is having a lot of trouble achieving its objectives, that has having vehicles destroyed in mass. I think it's 500 plus by now confirmed by um, open source in, uh, intelligence researchers. Uh, why is it that they've kept the networks on? And well, first, first question again, do you think that the hypothesis is correct that they had them on initially um, because they wanted to broadcast a message about their successes? And then second, why is it that they've kept them on now that most of the um, news for Russia is bad and paints a very ugly picture about their capabilities? Well, it's a good question because uh, I agree that they were hoping, and it was a miscalculation of uh, Russian government, that they will have this war very fast. I think they were looking to have their success roll into Kiev literally in a few days, not what's happening today. And of course, Putin not was expecting such a resistance, which was miscalculation completely. Today, he understanding this, but I think he's still allowing the communications to be exist because A, they're trying to watch Ukrainians, listen to Ukrainians, and use this for their advantage. I think what I was learning from my teams on the ground that Russians trying to literally listen to all communication of uh, Ukrainians, and they're trying to observe this because Putin was anticipating that A, he can get into Ukraine fast, right now not. So he don't want to be blind and he trying to observe what Ukrainians will be producing and projecting and screening to the world. So I think it's more kind of visibility of the enemy because you don't want to be blind in enemy territory, but you also want to see what your enemy doing, what your enemy have on you. And I think that's one of the reasons why they don't want to do it at that point. And I think for him, it's essential because his soldiers are lost there. I hear stories which are incredible that Ukrainians took all the signs from the literally freeways and uh, Russian soldiers got lost, lost in Ukraine. So it's interesting how Ukrainians finding a very creative ways to fight well-equipped enemy. And that's a great thing. And I think for Putin, he will be not expecting, but it will happen exactly like in Second World War, how Ukrainians were fighting the Nazis. It's going to be partisan in a forest fighting heavy armory. So it's it's very interesting to observe how lessons of the past were adapted by Ukrainians and they can easily even adapt cocktail Molotov that was since Maidan there and destroy heavy armory. So that's why for Putin, essential to keep eye on Ukraine through their own communications. Bob and Janet or, or Janet, anything to piggyback on that? Um, if not, it's okay. No, no, actually, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, the, the one minor thought is uh, I think uh, Putin did think this was going to be easy, number one. And uh, number two, he didn't want to destroy the infrastructure because he wanted to take over a functioning country. So to destroy the, uh, you know, power grid uh, or uh, the, the network, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just very painful. I mean, I do networking for a business. You know, once you blow up a mobile phone center, uh, you blow up the fiber, you blow up the switching stations, the software's gone. It, it takes like years to fix. It's not an instant thing, right? So I'm sure the planners in Moscow were thinking, let's just do a quick takeover and keep the economy going and make some money. I think now that they've realized that's not going to happen, the risk the, the, the serious risk is they now say, let's just blow it up. I mean, and, and if that, it, that could happen any day. So if, if they shift to the next phase, uh, it, it will be uh, totally horrific on the ground because people are going to be trapped if they start deciding, if they, if they decide to bomb. And, and of course, none, nobody here on this call, as Bob has mentioned, can predict if Putin will bomb or not. Uh, I hope he doesn't, but if he does, it'll be true horror. So. Yeah, and actually news from last night, um, some people might not even have seen it, although I expect everyone on this call um, or watching right now has, you know, the attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, um, I think, perked a lot of attention up, you know, one that you would attack a plant. Um, now, from the Russian perspective, it is pretty understandable why they're trying to capture it, because it 
controls 50% of Ukraine's nuclear output, which is 50% of the overall output. And so you can turn lights on or off and it's an important strategic, uh, strategic asset. But it's still shocking that you would fire tanks and have artillery fights and invade an object like that, especially because as Ukraine has already unfortunately learned and everyone else around Ukraine and around the world, nuclear accidents that happen in Ukraine don't stay in Ukraine or that happen anywhere don't stay uh, where they happened. Any comments or thoughts on that, um, you know, in particular, and whether that changes the West's calculus and in, in how they look at and consider um, solutions to um, or support for this conflict? Well, well I, I think uh, the fact that they were fighting by nuclear uh, plant supports the narrative that Putin couldn't care less. I mean, you, you know, one of the things uh, that's been irritating to me personally, as I watch the news, and I'm sure everybody watching the news, is every now and then you get some expert who over intellectualizes everything and says, oh, you know, maybe this sanction or, or saying this different. I don't think Putin watches TV. And I, I don't think Putin is watching TV sweating over or he's on Twitter feeling nervous anytime someone says something mean about him. He just couldn't care less. And uh, he's, he's, he's going to take Ukraine. He's made up his mind. And the only issue is how many people die. So I, I think the, 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 the thing we should get out of the fight at the nuclear reactor is he just doesn't care. He, he's not worried about that. We are worried about that. Everybody on this call is worried about it. He isn't worried. Uh, you know, we are talking about sanctions. I bet he's not talking about sanctions. He's talking about, as was well pointed out, he wants to take the country and reestablish. I mean, you know, we've said that. And I, I think we here in the United States have to internalize the, his thought process and how serious he is and how aggressive he is to properly calibrate our response. Thank you. Um, Bob, you getting anything on that? If not, I, I, um, think, my I, I completely agree because at the end of the day, if yesterday was explosion of this power plant, which is the largest in Europe, it was taking over not only Ukraine, it was taking over Russia. And like it was just said, he cares about people zero. So for him, it doesn't matter if something like this was happening yesterday, the first thing that you hear from the Russian media, that Ukrainians explode this, that they, 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 because that's the narrative that I will tell you, I was watching and Alex, I sent it to you. I, I, I was watching the uh, animation movie that shown right now in the Russian schools. And it starts that Russia trying to destroy Ukrainian arms that been used to kill civilians that wants peace in Donetsk and Donbass. And Russia coming to destroy these things, but the West don't hear that. The only West hear, it's what Ukraine say, that Russia is aggressor, but Russia always wanted peace. Russia always ready to sit and talk about peace, but Ukraine is the bad guys. Ukraine is the ones that are all the time fighting and want to destroy everybody. And America and NATO, is trying to help them to destroy civilians. And I will tell you, that's the narrative. And technically, if the power plant was exploded yesterday, which is 10 times bigger than Chernobyl, technically, that's what it can happen, then Ukraine will be blown. Ukraine will be basically pointed out and said, it's them who did it. Yesterday, one of my guys from the, from the ground sent me a video how Russia twisted one of their rocket things and started inside Russian territory to shoot it on a border village just to create illusion that it's Ukrainians literally sh shelling the peaceful village on the border of the Soviet Union. That's how narrative created. Thank and you. Putin care, care zero for the people, Russians or Ukrainians. Thank you, Evgeny. Um, for everybody, I guess, in whatever order, I mean, now that we've sort of talked about this picture where Putin has decided he wants all of Ukraine, again, as a Ukrainian American involved um, in the community and in, in helping Ukraine and working with Ukraine, that's been clear, but now I think it's clear to everyone. So he's decided he wants the whole country. It's critical to him. He 
doesn't care about the consequences of things like attacking nuclear power plants or leveling cities, which again, if you look at Syria or Grozny, that's already should have been established, but now it's clear and it's happening in the heart of Europe. What are the best things that we can do to stop him? And it's also critically important to stop him, right? So is it um, you know, sanctions, for example, on the oligarchs so that they can affect change inside Russia? Because Putin, to me, seems as the only person in Russia committed to this path, right? He has no way to divorce himself from the decision and divorce himself from the actions that are happening. Um, but that's not necessarily true for the other elite of Russia. So perhaps that's one place to focus on. Is it as the Ukrainians have been calling for and are changing, modulating it a bit, um, either a no-fly zone or um, in the absence of that, and it was rejected again uh, today um, by NATO, perhaps providing better to surface to air missiles so Ukrainians can fight effectively on the ground, which they've proven they can do. So if there's sky cover, um, they can probably hold the Russian army back. Is it something else that we haven't thought of? Uh, for, for example, you know, helping China understand that it's not in their interest to continue to support Russia in this in any way. So what is the best thing that the United States and the West, long story short, what is the best thing the United States can West can do in your opinion to bring this war to a close in a way that uh, saves Ukraine as a Western liberal democracy? And also as we've pointed out, why that, that's important for saving ourselves and saving Western liberal democracy in sure. general. So, so uh, one thing we can do is, uh, you know, within this fire community, uh, a lot of the members are hugely influential, both at the, the, the state and federal level. A lot of the members have strong friends in Congress. Uh, and I'm talking to the people, uh, the, the audience here. I would really ask everybody to use your uh, personal connections with Congress and, and the White House to really say, you know, we, we need to do more sanctions. We, there's a lot more we can do. And a lot of the debate has been about, you know, if we do too much, we will hurt America in terms of inflation and, and energy. You, you know, uh, energy and inflation problems are gonna be minor to a, a global war. Uh, that, that's the cheaper solution. So I'd encourage everybody to do that. The other thing I would encourage everybody to do on this call is to really emphasize the link and partnership between China and Russia. This is a coordinated action and that we should be ready to uh, sanction China if they keep providing material support, both on the surveillance side and on the economic side. Again, that's gonna appear very painful, but I'll tell you right now, uh, far less painful than a blowout between a US aircraft carrier in Taiwan. I mean, we are, we are not ready for that. So. I would uh, ask everybody on this call to really think about using your personal connections and resources. And I know a lot of the members on this call are hugely influential and I, I'd ask for your support. Uh, Bob? Well, um, I think that was very, very well put. And I think the most important thing uh, that we as a nation can do and as a group of free nations is to improve the lethality of the Ukrainians by any way possible. It's extremely important that lethality be top of the list, I think. And I mean uh, killing people, yes, as many Russians as can be killed as possible. Um, focus on that lethality, but also destroy hardware. Uh, hardware cannot be instantly replaced, so destroy hardware. Um, improving that lethality, uh, though, if we can help the Ukrainians do that by any weapon supplies possible, do it and do it faster. But I want to mention another strategic thing, um, and that is I think we as a nation and we as influencers should also think through strategically about our relationship with the country of India, one of the great nations of the world. And if you look at it from a historical perspective, since their, the founding of the current uh, country in uh, 1947, they have really been mistreated in this relationship. I think um, they have been ignored. We have worked against their interests. We have driven them into the arms of the old Soviet Union for weapons procurements. Um, now they are a great and growing and powerful nation, and we support them against China, but not enough. Um, we really need to do more for them. And I think if we would have done more, uh, perhaps they would have more strongly condemned this horrible Russian um, action. And it just really underscores that we need to reevaluate the relationship there, build a stronger relationship with India to oppose not just China, but Russia. Uh, there are many other things to do, but those are two top on my list. 
Evgeny, if you could come in and then we're going to move to the question and answer portion. I know there's a I, lot of questions. I think from my perspective, uh, media, 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 media. I'm trying to use media as they use it, media, because like I said, in today's world, and I saw it in Syria, even Syrians mentioned this uh, on the streets, that camera became a weapon. So I use in media because uh, media is a powerful tool. You know what? We threw on fire when I was documenting uh, Maidan, Maidan revolution. I know it was even thinking that the same movie can inspire Venezuela, Nicaragua, Chile, Lebanon, Hong Kong. It was 28 or 29 of July 2019. 40 different places in Hong Kong were watching Winch on Fire screening on the streets in the squares in underground. I remember how Yellow West movement in France started with inspiration of Winch on Fire and then was hijacked by certain elements and moved into a completely different direction. So media is a powerful tool. Media is a powerful tool for, to, for Putin specifically to control his people. Media and, and is a powerful tool. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. So we need yeah. also to kind of uh, be able to, through our connections in social and everything, to help to control narrative. And, and Evgeny, I know we need to jump to questions, but there's one thing that I didn't mention. So the other film that you've done um, recently and your most recent one is Francesco uh, about Pope Francis. And of course, Pope John Paul II, as many on this call in, in the world remember, had an instrumental role in helping the West defeat the Soviet Union, which he understood uh, as an evil at the time. Um, are there parallels there today? Can there be a, a is there a role for um, faith um, to, to play in this? Uh, and also, of course, the splitting of the church. I mean, there's this whole dynamic. We could do an entire panel about what this is going to do to Orthodox Christianity. And uh, But uh, my question is specifically about um, Pope Francesco, Pope Francis, because of your uh, recent film in relationship with him. I think we can see that for the recent years, because the church signed autocephaly for the Ukrainian church, and Francis was standing behind that, uh, there is a big, big separation between Francis and Kirill. That's number one. We haven't seen Kirill even close coming to the Vatican or meeting Francis anywhere since their historic meeting in Cuba. So since that meeting, Kirill never was anywhere in a close proximity to Francis. I think there is a big separation. Now, there is a difference between church. Church of Francis and church what Francis is basically trying to create these days and fighting with the right wing of his own church same like we fighting this right wing of uh, the, our part of the country. I think Francis is really representing this freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and uh, something that the church of Russia and Kirill represents is completely in opposite direction. I think Francis is trying to mediate right now. As many of you know, and maybe don't know, on Thursday when the invasion happens, he broke first protocol in history and went personally to, US, to Russian embassy to Holy See to see ambassador and to seek some kind of solution to stop the invasion. Pope, who usually receives heads of the states and ambassadors at the Holy See, went into the car and without security, only with the driver and secretary, went to the embassy. That's unprecedented protocol done by the Pope Francis. So he is legitimate leader who tried with his leadership to try to do things for the world. He deeply care about Ukraine. And uh, Wednesday, he had a prayer for Ukraine. Almost every day there is a prayer for Ukraine. So okay. he deeply care for the people. Yes. Thank you. Let's jump to questions. Evan, over to you. Yeah, so um, I don't know, Ty, if you want to come up and join us. Um, but you were asking about the power plant and I feel like we did cover it, but um, you had some kind of further questions. No, it's just, it's just a statement really of whether it's true or not, that's my big question. But the issue of uh, the power plant with the uh, Russian troops mining the power plant and therefore holding uh, Europe hostage, um, threatening to blow up uh, the reactors. Um, so I think that if that's true, that's a new level of low. Um, and uh, certainly uh, gets it more into a despotic type situation uh, and dealing with these situations and putting, you know, when, when the comment of Putin not caring about anybody, uh, if this is a true situation, that certainly would uh, lend credence to that thought. As far as I know, there's only one source on that. And it's the kind of source that uh, has reported accurately in the past, 
but this is war and you never know. And so we That's need right. more sources to confirm. And that yeah. uh, one source was an official statement. So um, it could be that that's happened, or it could be that we need more confirmation, confirming information. Uh, even if we uh, think it fits the narrative, um, it's, for me, impossible to know without confirming information. No, I just thought it was a timely comment considering the discussion. And as I pointed in my note, it was just one report. Um, so, uh, but it does mean that, uh, you know, I, I do think that it would be very odd to have for a Ukrainian to do this as a disinformation campaign, considering um, that it would give Russians potentially an idea. Um, so that also makes me wonder. Yeah. Okay, Kaida Altine, you had a question about kind of whether this will wind up in a, in a Cold War uh, East-West Germany kind of situation. You want to come up and join us? If Kai's not here, um, he, he just sent it to me in a personal message too, but he said, as a former East German, do we see this as, as winding up in some sort of, you know, cut, split down the middle East and West Ukraine situation? Is that what Putin wants? Um, and what would you ask from the German government was a follow on. So you were asking Alex what, what people should want from the uh, US response. Let me, I'll, I'll tackle that very quickly in two comments. One is, um, you know, so far we've seen the view and which is where my family is from Western Ukraine um, has not been as touched. I mean, it's not that there's been no operations, but um, and or if you look at Lukashenko's map and some of the um, views that Putin has expressed in the past, he was seemed willing to leave some kind of a rump state that in his mind, Poland could absorb because he thinks in those kinds of power politics um, and denies the state uh, the, that denies that Ukraine is a state. So perhaps that's in the cards. From his perspective, um, we'll see. Um, that remains to be seen. But as far as what Russia, Germany can do, so far they've done much more than I personally expected. I, I think, um, oddly, we're talking about nuclear power plants. Um, you know, obviously, energy security is top of the list, and and um, I've been surprised how quickly everyone has recognized we can't rely on Russian gas anymore. Um, I've seen reports today uh, that Ukraine might have stopped transiting gas through its pipeline. I mean, that was going to have to happen. It might get damaged. That's also possible. But we as, a, as the world, with Germany as really one of the main partners in that discussion, need to start thinking about where we get our energy from and diversifying away from Russian energy sources as, as absolutely quickly as possible. Yeah, I, I, just to add to Alex's, I mean, I think all of us are learning a lot uh, my one of my personal disappointments is, uh, in addition to India not being a little bit uh, more aligned with us, and and I think Bob's comment that some of this is America's fault. The the bigger disappointment is Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, not supporting the United States. Uh, as you know, uh, as I speak right now, U.S. military personnel are protecting Saudi Arabia. So I I, I think everybody in this call should be very upset <laughs> that we protect Saudi Arabia with our lives. And all we asked them was to increase the pumping, which they have capacity and they declined. So I, I, I think uh, there's a lesson learned that all of us need to internalize. And again, there's a lot of very influential people on this call. I can see your names. I'd ask you to consider talking to your member of Congress, irrespective of what party that you're, they're in and pointing that out. We, we should not let this go. Oh, back to you. Uh, I realized I lost question. I lost the thread a bit. The initial question was about a, a Cold War and a new wall and maybe Kiev is the new Berlin. Um, I, I think Kiev would probably fall on the other side of that line if Russia is able to seize a lot of territory. But there is a wall going up. I mean, the, I don't think these economic sanctions are going to go away. I don't think Russia's escalation is going to go away. The only way that is possible in the short to medium term, in my view, is if uh, there's a leadership change because Putin uh, can't work with the West anymore. Yeah, and maybe just so um, for the for the panel, part of that question, I think, was just do we see this as I've seen reports that there's no way and that's kind of what I what I think I'm seeing. There's no way that Putin has any plan to fall back unless he really has to. He's really looking to seize the whole country. And I think that's perhaps what Kai is asking about. Right. Is it is this going to be like a, another big chunk um, like Crimea, but but much larger and it's just the eastern half or, or do we think it's just a full scale? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the other interpretation of the question is I do believe the Cold War between the United States and Russia and China is officially on. <laughs> so, so irrespective of you know what happens to Ukraine, sadly, no way. yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, everybody should internalize that, uh, you know, we are an open conflict with both countries right now. 
and everything we do every day is is very important. Um, so we have another question from Bob and Bob, do you want to come up? And if not, so Bob and asks, if there were nuclear fallout, where would it go? Oh, sounds like yeah. Mike. Oh. Yep, sorry, we just had someone that was a, a person with a hot mic again. Um, if there were nuclear fallout, where would it go? Russia first, China, which way would the plume go? Um, that's kind of a doozy, but um, Bob, do you want to take that? Oh, uh, prevailing winds go towards uh, Russia and China, um, and but then circle around the globe. So we all uh, got dosed from Chernobyl. Um, and But of course, the closer you are, the worse dose you get. So uh, depending on how big this is, it would circle the globe. Here's one from Kevin Turner. Kevin, you want to ask that? I think that'll be our last question, but it's kind of a good one to end on. Sure. You know, uh, we all know how uh, uh, the Russians were influencing our politics in 2016, and undoubtedly they continue to try to do that today. Uh, does any panel have any idea or any comment about what's going on today in our own country regarding politics and our media and how Putin may be influencing it? Um, other than Tucker Carlson, who seems stubbornly committed to his narrative, I, I think um, this has made it impossible for Russia to have the type of influence that it had to date. And I, I agree completely that in 2016, even before that influence was pretty significant, um, it is going to be very hard for anybody here to take a pro-Russia position, um, even uh, Donald Trump. And, and you've seen that modulation in his speaking. That doesn't mean that they can't exploit internal weaknesses. And we make that easier by having internal divisions. And as uh, someone pointed out earlier, there's a lot of finger pointing, even when we're trying to deal with this crisis. But I think it's just good that this, this has made it much harder for that to be as effective as it was in the past. So let me say I, that if you look at our, oh, sorry, Janine, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say the uh, we we have to accept Russian disinformation and Chinese disinformation as a fact of life, but the best countermeasure is exactly what we're doing today, which is uh, having forums like this and reaching out to people. That is the only countermeasure to infiltration on social media, and 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 I and I think we we have to uh, do as much of that and encourage other people to meet and talk. Uh, Bob, back to you. I just wanted to say, if you look at the history of our country and our culture, it has been one of a lot of division, even in conflict, unfortunately. Think of the Revolutionary War and the support that the British had there. Uh, and that's just the first example. Go through every war we've ever had. The Great Civil War, we fought each other. Uh, World War I, there were people who said we shouldn't be there, and maybe we shouldn't have. But there were people who took the sides of the uh, of the Germans the, in World War II. Prior to World War II, I should say, uh, there were people who really admired the Nazis, including famous names uh, like Ford. Henry Ford uh, was saying great things about Hitler. Um, 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 so I tell you, it's there's always going to be some in this country uh, who support the adversary. But if you look at the Cold War, uh, that was a minimal number, seemed like it was manageable. Will it be that way now? Uh, that remains to be seen. I certainly hope that as a very small minority that thinks Putin is doing wonderful things here. Um, and I, I just, uh, it turns my stomach to say they're going to be here, but I'm positive there are going to be a measurable um, amount of people that take his side. And Yevgeny, hey, just, Alex, this just is me. Go ahead. Alex, Go ahead. I, just I also want you to talk about that we'll be screening Winter on Fire and getting that message out to Janaid's point. So you could talk about right, that right, right, effort right. in coordination with Fire. I just wanted to say something that there is a whole chain and there is a whole spider's web of the people around some of our politicians that if you will look right now on this thing, you will see amazing faces of some of our politicians that are in this beautiful chart and the links between Vladimir Putin and his money people. You can see it on this chart. So at the end of the day, in today's world, there is, even in America, there is a link between Trump, whose face you can see multiple times here, Mitch McConnell, and some other recognizable figures who are in this country, and the money that links to Putin. So there is influence. There is influence that is still there, there is influence that's going to be influencing certain politics in this country. Yeah. 
And I think that's um, uh, an important issue to continue to combat. Um, I'm glad you, you brought it up, Evgeny. Um, at that, we are very, very, very much out of time. So the next panel starts in one minute. So I have to rush us out of here. Thank you so much for your time, everyone.